With the workbooks, some people think this workbook is only relevant for two days during the workshop, and then I'll throw it in the bin. Firstly, firstly, they cost two hundred dollars to print, so don't throw it in the bin. Secondly, secondly, the reason we spent two hundred bucks to print it is because every single scripture on deliverance from the New Testament is in there. So you've got everything from the Book of Matthew, you've got everything from the Book of Acts. Um, we didn't do Luke and J John and, and Mark because obviously we don't want to double up with the Gospel of Matthew four times. So we've basically just done one Gospel. So uh, when you were looking for those scriptures, you might be you might be having an evening meal with your friends and family, and then uh, someone might say, "Hey, I've got anxiety attacks and, and depression." And you go, "Oh, let's pray for you." And you say in the name of Jesus, and then. <laughs> Suddenly, all this training is going to be very, very relevant. And you'll go, get the book! Get the book. <laughs> There's some steps in the book, quick, get the book! The Sorry, thank you. So that, I prophesy that that is going to happen. Amen. I receive it. I might uh, go through it quickly. Now, um, there's some really important scriptures, which is, there's one I didn't do yesterday. Okay, so this one's really important and I kind of uh, missed it last time. So Matthew 18, 21 to 35. So this is actually page 5 of the uh, new booklet. So if you don't have it, it's okay because uh, it's not in the old booklet. So what I'm going to get you to do is just to um, write down the key, key points. So a lot of people like to follow along in their Bible while the preacher's preaching. Um, the idea of that is because if the preacher gets up and preaches something different, you can catch him out. Trust me, I'm going to read it word for word, don't worry. So what I prefer that people do is actually take notes of what you learn during the reading. So this one says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times. And Jesus says, I tell you, not just seven, but 77 times. Now, this is really important for a number of reasons. How many times do you think Jesus has forgiven you? Uh, <laughs> probably 77 times 7, and seven, 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 times is like 777. Yeah. Exactly. And so, uh, what am I getting at here? What I'm getting at here is there's a spirit called legalism and there's a spirit called judgment. And both of them are religious spirits. And they're very alive and healthy and active in the Christian church. So much so that Christianity worldwide is more famous for judgment and condemnation and legalism than it is for just about anything else. Now, that's not all our faults. You know, we can blame the old denominations that uh, have all their issues and we can blame him and blame her. But the point is, the world knows us for that. And why would the world know us for that? Because nobody's casting out any religious spirits. <laughs> They're, they're just coming in, they're getting on leadership teams, and next thing you know, they're pastoring churches and they're teaching legalism from the pulpit. And then they're spreading, teaching religion, condemnation from the pulpit, and then some shame and guilt to go with it, and then judgment. You know, I'll give you an example. Churches find a young couple in, uh, messed up, made a little sin, ended up sleeping together. You know what the pastors used to do in the legalistic churches? Embarrass them in front of the whole church, publicly shaming them. The poor guys had trauma for the next 20 years and felt shame and guilt and fake Christians just because of one sin. Jesus caught a woman in the act of adultery. Did he shame and guilt her? No. So here we have to have a bit of understanding. Now, what if the person's sin is different to your sin? Well, you need to understand that the devil's not going to use the same tactics on everyone. You might go, oh, it's so disgusting. That guy's got a pornography addiction. How disgusting. Oh, and the next thing you know, you're gossiping about that and telling your friends about that. Guess what? That's probably worse than what he's doing. So the spirit of accusation is a demonic spirit. And uh, we won't go into deep, deep detail, but I'll just tell you this. Every time that you point your finger at the brethren and make an accusation, it doesn't matter if it's true, half true, or completely false. Every time you do that, you remind God of the other voice that comes before the throne day and night, also accusing the brethren. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to have much in common with the accuser of the brethren. There's a time where uh, this needs to be said. It's really important. There's a time where uh, in the Bible where uh, Noah gets drunk, which is not a nice look for a man of God. And then to make it worse, he passes out on the ground asleep naked. Also not a real good look for a man of God. Who knows that in the Bible, some of these men of God makes a few bad decisions. 
Now, do you think God said, oh, that's it, I don't love him now anymore, he's a false teacher? Mm. No. So God's grace covers him the same way that the boys with the blanket covered him. Who did God curse in that story? God cursed the ones who pointed the finger and said, look at him, ha, ha, ha. Now, were they lying? Did they make up a false story about Noah? No. All they did was point the finger and maybe have a laugh. That was enough for God to put a curse directly on them, and that curse probably went on their kids and their kids and their kids, all because of accusing. So I just wanted to really point that out. So uh, when we do deliverance, we actually get people to repent of things like accusation, gossip, slander, and especially malicious gossip, cause intent, because there's actually a spirit of gossip, there's a spirit of accusation, and uh, the enemy would try to destroy your gathering, your church, your ministry, through that spirit. In the same way he trying to destroy a church through a spirit of uh, gossip or a spirit of uh, accusation, slander. In Australia, we say loose lips sink ships. <laughs> you guys don't say that here? Yeah, we do. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's like loving, loving, loving. So, anyway, um, so we, we, we've got this grace thing down pat. Now, what do I do if there's a complete false teacher with a completely demonic message? Okay, the first thing I don't do is point the finger and publicly accuse him with his name. What I do is I say, I, I quote the scripture, which we're going to look at in a minute, that says, if you preach a false gospel, you can receive a different Jesus and a different spirit. And it's written to a Christian church in Corinth. And all seven of the churches uh, in Revelations are in modern day Turkey. That's where they were located geographically. And uh, he basically tells them that, hey, you guys have got some false prophets going around and they're spreading some... Uh, legalism and some Jewish law and some made-up doctrine. Who knows that's going on today? So the number one warning that the Bible gives in the end times, the number one warning is false prophets, false teaching, and great falling away. And it says that even the elect can be deceived. Um, even God's chosen called the people led by His Spirit, even they can be deceived. So uh, sometimes when we're doing deliverance, this is kind of way out there, but it comes out that the Spirit's legal right to be there is because in their church they've been told false teaching. And because they've submitted under a false teaching, they've embraced the demonic doctrine, they've also embraced the Spirit that came with it. So when, when someone gets up on here and they preach that the way to Jesus is not narrow, that anyone can just come along, no problems, everybody's saved, all you have to do is say a few words with your mouth, believe in your head, and you will be saved. You know, if I confess with my mouth, doesn't the Bible say if I confess with my mouth, believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord, that I will be saved? Actually, that's written to people who were already saved. That is absolutely not written to unsaved people. So what does that mean? That means that the reason they were saved is because they were already saved. And what Paul is saying is if you, if you keep to the, your confession of faith that you've already made, then up until the end, then you will be saved in the end anyway. So don't have um, like disappointment. So the servant, back in the story of the Bible, the servant fell on his knees before him. Have patience with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. So this is talking about the, um, the servant that wouldn't forgive. Now, I'll wind it back one scripture. Um, so this is back to Matthew 18, 21. This is in book, page 5 of the new ones, of the new ones we just printed. If you don't have the new one, just, uh, just make a note anywhere. So because of this, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Okay, who's the king in the story? Jesus is the king. Jesus is the king in the story. Okay, Jesus is the king. So it says he wanted to settle account with his servant. Who's the servant of the king? Us. Us. We're servants of the king. As he began the settlements, a debtor was brought to him owing 10,000 talents. Since the man was unable to pay, the master ordered him to... He sold to pay back his debt along with his wife and children, everything he owned. The servant fell on his knees, have patience with me, I'll pay back everything, beg for forgiveness. His master had compassion on him, forgave all of his debt and released him. That's us. That, that story can only be applied to a believer in Jesus because nobody else has been forgiven of a gigantic debt. So this is the number one scripture to give to people that are uh, telling you that Christians don't never need deliverance ever, ever, ever. Given this scripture, it's literally targeting Christians. It's telling you what will happen if you're a disobedient servant. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and he began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down and begged him, have patience with me, I'll pay you back. But he refused. 
And instead, he went and had the man go into prison and he pay back his debt. When his fellow servants saw what happened, they were greatly distressed. They went and recounted everything to the master. Then the master summoned him back and declared, You wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured. Now, other translations says where he will be tormented day and night until he should repay back everything that he owed. Or another way you could say it is until he forgave. Now, this is literally saying that if Christians get forgiven of a gigantic debt, we're talking a huge debt. I mean, before we were saved, we were, we were, we were staring down the barrel of the lake of fire and then Jesus was crucified with nails through his hands and feet. And we all know what the crucifixion, everything Jesus went to, ripped his beard out, caught a crown of uh, thorns on the head, the whole, the whole works. 39 lashes and whips to the back. It says he was marred more than any man in Isaiah. More than any man. And he did that for you. And if we can't forgive someone because they offended us, or because they yelled at us, or you name it, whatever it is, then what we're doing is we become the disobedient servant in this story. And uh, my question that I ask people is, what kind of prison do you think he was sent to? Do you think it was a physical prison? No, it's a spiritual prison. Mm -hmm. So if people get sent to a spiritual prison, then what kind of tormentors might there be there? Mm -hmm. Spiritual tormentors. Mm -hmm. So Jesus didn't really need you to know exactly what would happen, that demons would enter you and you would be put in a spiritual prison. Why, why Jesus wasn't completely specific about demons and so on was because if we follow this word, we don't even experience that prison ever. So he expected us to believe the teaching and then to follow it without questioning. You know when a little kid gets told, don't do this, don't touch the hot plate, don't touch the hot plate? You don't always, you say to the kid, you don't always have to know a hundred reasons why I don't want you to touch the hot plate. I'm telling you, don't touch the hot plate. And then little Johnny goes, oh, I touch it. Shh. <laughs> Hooks his hand. Ah, oh, mommy, daddy, I want to sit with you. He's like, I'm going to give you sympathy. I told you a hundred times not to touch the hot plate. <laughs> so that's a little bit like this. If we disobey God and we refuse to forgive people, we end up in a prison with tormentors day and night. Now, if you talk to someone who's oppressed by 50 evil spirits or more, they will tell you that they can't even hold down a job. We had a lady who prayed for deliverance today, fully delivered of every single demonic spirit that she had, been wanting deliverance for years and years and years, in and out of psychiatric ward, fully delivered today. Woo! Amen. Come on. Come on. And, um, she will tell you she couldn't sleep for nearly a year, more than a year of not sleeping. Almost a year. So this is the kind of things that happen if the enemy comes in. Now, this is just one way that the enemy comes in. So if you're taking notes, this is one of the most important notes of the whole night, which is that unforgiveness is an open door to demonic spirits. And they have a legal right to torment you. And they'll continue to do that up until the time that you forgive. Now, what do you do if it's really difficult to forgive and you can't manage to do it on your own? Well, the first thing you can do is uh, you can spend time renewing your mind yeah. So uh, we need to renew our mind, change the way we think, read the word of God, change the way we think, read the word of God, change the way we think. So we're going to skip forward through a few scriptures because there's a lot to get through tonight and uh, we're not going to get time to read every scripture in the manual, otherwise we'll be here till uh, midnight. So I'm skipping right forward to page 19, which is on the uh, new, new book. And uh, there are some of these new books I'm talking about. There are actually three up the front, and there's actually a bunch in a box down there. If it really troubles you that you have the older version, it's like the latest update. <laughs> so the following verses. So it's Isaiah 42, 6 to 7. It says, I, the Lord, have called you for righteous purpose, and I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to free the captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness, 
So part of that darkness is not being saved, not having Jesus. The part of that darkness is being under the ownership of the devil. And you might say ownership. That's a pretty strong word to be using about the devil. Well, I'll just quickly mention something. When Jesus spoke to the devil, the devil offered Jesus a compromise to save humanity. The devil said to Jesus, um, actually, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all of the people, all of the human race, all of the kingdoms, I'll give them back to you. And Jesus stopped the devil and said, what are you talking about? Blasphemy, they're not your people. No? Why didn't Jesus stop him and say that was a lie? Because it wasn't a lie. So the whole human race is about the same fallen as the demons. So much so that they're under the ownership of Satan and on their way to hell with Satan. That's pretty far fallen, wouldn't you say? And the Bible says Jesus died for you while you were his enemy. And we all know that uh, there were three crosses on the hill, right? There was uh, the two murderers on Jesus' left and right. And uh, Jesus took the cross in the middle. But who was the cross in the middle prepared for? It was prepared for Barabbas because he was supposed to be crucified. He was the worst criminal, and that's the reason why he was on the middle cross, because he was the worst criminal. And they thought, Pontius Pilate thought that the people were going to say, let go free Jesus and kill Barabbas. That's why he did it, because his wife had a dream that night that Jesus was a holy man of God and not to kill him, warn you, you know? So he knew that Jesus might be the real deal, so he wanted to set Jesus free, and people kept insisting and insisting. And if you want to see it through the eyes of the Spirit, it wasn't just people yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. There was demons in the people yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. So that would demonically fuel those people. So what I'm getting at is if Jesus took the space of Barabbas, then what does that make us? Barabbas. We are the criminal. We are the criminal. We are Barabbas. That's whose place Jesus took. It's called the Great Exchange. The Bible says, while we were his enemies, he died for us. So when you have that revelation, you have a bit of a deeper revelation of why the world needs deliverance, because you realize that the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. The Bible says that. It says that the, the, the devil blinds the minds of the unbelievers. We've had people that basically were so demonized that they couldn't get saved without deliverance, because they were so wrapped up in chains and fetters that they were like the man in the uh, cemetery, the man that... Uh, couldn't, couldn't even, you know, think for himself, couldn't even, you know, couldn't even live with a normal life because he was so heavily demonized, he was self-harming in a cemetery, howling like, a, like an animal. So that's pretty interesting. By the way, just a free revelation, when you have uh, revival meetings, um, the Holy Spirit's presence can turn up really strong because the Bible says he, he broods over his word to perform it and also that he inhabits the praises of his people. So when you go to these uh, full-blown revival meetings, some of the manifestations are actually because when light comes into a room, the darkness that's in there can't stay hidden. So some of you are pretty uncomfortable with some of the weird manifestations that happen in revival meetings. So I just want you to be aware that almost uh, everyone with the divine spirit will start to manifest if there's a really strong presence of God. Because Christians usually say that outpouring was completely demonic because of a few, you know, wild manifestations. That's what the conservative type of church, the Bible church, thinks. And then the charismatics are like, no, 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 the Holy Spirit's making people do animal noises. The Holy Spirit's making people bark like a dog and chew like a chicken. Well, guess what? There's an evil spirit that went back there it barks like a dog. Yeah? The dog spirit, obviously. <laughs> So uh, that spirit can be cast out in the name of Jesus. We don't actually know its name, so we'll call it the, the puppy dog spirit. Or little fluffy. Um, what's that guy? Back in the 1900s, there was a guy who was the evangelist that became an alcoholic. A.A. A. Allen. Okay. So if you type into YouTube, A.A. A. Allen casts out dog spirit, you'll have a lady going, roof, roof, roof. And then it goes, in the name of Jesus, come out. And then, and then all this like white goo comes out of it. So he actually cast out a spirit that was causing the dog noises. So let's not be simpletons in a meeting and presume that every single manifestation is God doing it. God's not a puppet who's controlling people to do strange things. And uh, you've also got the flesh. And so some people are so hungry, they're like little children, they come into a meeting, they're so hungry for God that they'll literally fake a manifestation. Okay. So in other words, they'll line up for prayer and they'll lay their hands on them and they'll go, Whoa, and they'll launch themselves back and shake 
on the floor like a fish and in their head they're thinking, I'm encouraging everybody else's faith. And my own grandmother, she was like the most Jesus-like person you'll ever meet. She's like, pray for me. So I'm like, all right, in the name of Jesus. And she goes, oh, and pretend to fall over. I'm like, come on, grandma. I know that was a courtesy drop. Courtesy <laughs> drop. I was like, Grandma, I don't need my ego to be encouraged. It's bad enough as it is. It was repentant. So anyway, uh, it's, just, it's just important to keep that in mind, uh, all of these things. Okay, so let's skip to, um, okay, we just did Isaiah 42, 6. Now, is there any difference between a captive and a prisoner? A captive is taken captive by somebody else. A prisoner sinned and opened the door to the enemy and ended up in a prison because of their own sin. So Jesus came to set people where it was their own stupid fault and he came to set people free that didn't do anything wrong but were demonized and put in a cage because somebody sinned against them. Not to mention the enemy keeps people captive and in prison. And uh, the truth is if you see in the spirit you can see that many, many Christians all around the world are living in a prison their whole life. There's a book by an American preacher, and uh, he had a vision, and in his vision, he walks up to a jail warden who's carrying keys on his side, and uh, all the Christians are in prison cells, one after the other. There's a whole row of prison cells here, and a whole row of prison cells here, and he, this guy in the dream or vision, this guy in town, he walks up to the jail warden, and he goes, why are you keeping these Christians in prison? And he goes, what are you talking about? I'm a pastor, and this is my congregation. Uh, wow. <laughs> but he hadn't released anyone. They hadn't been released, which means they were what? Captain. Okay, so there's an overemphasis on being released when you're in a controlling environment. Notice I'm not up here going, none of you can go out and cast out any devils until I give you the right papers and say that you've been released. So that's, that's, um, that's an overemphasis of churchianity. Right? So the only thing that needs to be released is something that's being held captive. Okay? So, uh, you know, when I was in a church in Australia, I said, you know, the Satan's really crafty and really clever. All he has to do to lock up Christians in a prison is paint the word church on top of the prison. They all run in and lock themselves in themselves. Lock the door. And they sing songs in prison. I don't know. They pray in there. But nobody gets saved. Nobody gets healed. Nobody gets delivered even the guys in the prison. So what can we do about that? Well, let's not point the finger and tell them how dumb they are. You know what might be a good idea? To bring deliverance to set the captives free. So not every captive is out there a criminal on the streets or a Satan worshiper. Some of them are in nice, Bible-believing churches and they do love Jesus. They're genuine believers. They may have God's Spirit in them, which means they may be saved. And uh, all they're waiting for is someone with the power of the Holy Spirit and anointing to come and set them free. And when you do deliverance in these kind of places uh, where they, they're Bible believers, uh, it's, quite, it's quite beautiful to see their reactions because uh, they, um, they've never seen it before. And they're like, wow, what is this? They, they might think you're some kind of like world famous healing evangelist. And you're like, I'm little Sally from down the street. I just went to a few workshops. And... <laughs> come on. So there you go, guys. Okay, Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, when Jesus gives you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, what happens next? Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. The heavenly realm, you should probably put there. Because it's not talking about the third heaven. It's more referring to the, the, the heavenly realms where the enemies live and so on. So uh, I don't mind if you want to think something's being bound in the third heaven or the second heaven or the first heaven. The point is that it's not just talking about one place. That's what I really want to emphasize. Whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in the heavenlies. So the simple point of that is everything that we do in the spirit has um, like an echo in the spiritual realm. I once uh, prayed for a lady, she was getting delivered from demons, and the demon said, I know who you are. Paul, I know you, I know, and I know who you are too. <laughs> so anyway, I said, okay, all right, what's, how do you know of me or something? I asked her the question because... You, you know, not everyone does this, but you can if you want. It's not the unforgivable sin. There, there is an evangelist that teaches if, if a spirit speaks to a person, then that person is a medium, and you've made them a medium because you asked the question. Not true at all. Uh, Jesus talked to the devil three times. Did Jesus sin? No. No, no exactly. So uh, we can throw that teaching out in the water. 
Um, that, the evangelist that teaches that is actually a really good evangelist. It's just the, one of his very small teachings that's just a little bit mistaken based on one experience. So uh, we know that uh, we don't want to have a 10-hour conversation with a demon, but uh, it's okay if you want to ask it if it has a legal right to be there, for example. That's a pretty relevant question because it might say, yes, I do. She has cocaine in her bedroom, which happened once. She said, how do you know where I keep my cocaine? And he said, oh, yeah, the demon told you, told on you. All right, so under that one, when Jesus gives you the keys to the heaven, well, then whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in the heavenlies. It just think in the heavenlies. Uh, that's probably just the way to put that. And then Luke 10, I won't read it all, but it says, The Lord appointed 72 people. He sent them out two by two to heal the sick, to cast out demons. He told them, Even the dust on your feet, wipe it off as a testimony against them if they are not interested in Jesus. So there's houses of peace that are going to be receptive to Jesus in the gospel. And there's going to be houses of uh, no peace that are not going to be interested. So Jesus told them not to go out because there's going to be a bit of rejection? No. 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 So Jesus says, you're going to get a bit of rejection, go anyway to the next house. Why does it say shaking dust off your feet? Because he doesn't want you to take the rejection with you to the next place. Amen. So uh, as a note on that one, just write, don't take rejection with me. If you have another revelation, just put it down. Um, Jesus intended all of the 72 disciples to uh, heal the sick, cast out devils, and preach the gospel, and tell them that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And then it's got the disciples running back and saying, Wow, Jesus! Now they've seen healings, they've seen miracles, they've seen a lot of things, and they come back, and the thing they talk about is this. Wow, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So they were quite amazed at deliverance. Uh, there wasn't a lot of deliverance happening in the Old Covenant, so that was totally new for these people. Every other miracle in the Bible of the ministry of Jesus can be found in the Old Covenant. Miracles of supernatural food multiplication is found in the Old Covenant with jars of oil multiplying. Uh, miracles of people being resurrected from the dead is also found in the Old Covenant with prophets laying on dead bodies and coming back to life. Um, miracles of leprosy and blind eyes, so the healing miracles are also in the Old Covenant. So the only thing that was brand new for these people was the deliverance ministry. Even though they did have Jewish exorcists uh, running around trying to cast out spirits, but they were very ineffective. But they, you know, they gave it their best shot and they felt like they were having some impact. So uh, there's actually, there's, I should warn, there's a lot of ministries today that um, don't actually uh, get people delivered, but they advertise themselves as deliverance ministries. So some of them are kind of counselling, some of them are kind of inner healing. So don't confuse the inner healing ministries with uh, deliverance ministries. Mm, right. And then uh, we had someone today went through all some of the best deliverance ministries in North America, and not one spirit came out. Did they did they rebuke any spirits? No, no. They just uh, did the head knowledge, and then said everyone go home. And she went out of that meeting just as bound as she was when she went in. Mm. So you can have all the head knowledge in the world, but if you don't rebuke the spirit, it's still there. In fact, even when you repent, close every door, and renounce and repent till you're blue in the face, most of the time those spirits still lay dormant. Even if they've lost their legal right to be there, they just stay dormant until somebody casts them out. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously it would be better if we didn't have to do that. It would be great if we could just click our fingers. But I just want to teach you the truth that these things are very stubborn and they have to be rebuked. Uh, every time Jesus did it, he rebuked the spirits. Every time the disciples did it, they rebuked the spirits and made them leave through through verbal rebuking. Um, there's not much scripture on laying hands on the demonized. The Bible talks about laying hands on the sick and they shall recover. With the deliverance, it's often just um, it's mainly about the voice. So when you're praying for someone over the phone, through Facebook, um, through WhatsApp, through a phone call, um, you don't have to get in the car and drive five hours to their house. So we see the exact same percentages of people delivered over the phone as we see in person. It makes no difference because as long as the Spirit can hear the voice when I say, in the name of Jesus, you come out of this person. So that verbal command is what the Spirit goes, oh, I have to obey, I have to obey, he has authority over me. Do you know the difference between power and authority? Power is dunamis, authority in Greek is exousia. The best way to explain it is if a policeman pulls you over to give you a ticket and you pay the ticket, the reason you pay the ticket is because you responded to his authority. Mm -hmm. He has authority over you. Mm -hmm. 
So these spirits come out according to authority. They come out very quickly and very easily because they know that you have authority, right? Not every spirit responds to your authority. So even though you have authority over it, some spirits will challenge your authority. Has anyone seen on the news somebody resisting arrest? <laughs> That's what some of these spirits will do. They will resist arrest. Even though, even though that criminal is wrong, he's, he's committed a crime, the police has full authority over that criminal, mm -hmm. right, to handcuff him, he still resists arrest. Even though he's caught, sprung, not going anywhere, he's got guns on him, ten cops around him, he still resists arrest. That's like the devil. And so what does a policeman do if he's still resisting arrest? They use what? Taser. Force. Taser. Force. Taser. 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 Gun. Power. Handcuffs. Power. So that's, that's what power is. Power is to back up your authority. So let's just write that down. Spirits respond to authority. And if they don't, that is when you use force and power from on high which hopefully we've all been clothed with that power from on high already. You know, we've all heard the teachings on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. John the Baptist said, the one who's coming after me whose sandals I'm not even worthy to undo, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. You know why it separates the Holy Spirit from and with fire? Because some people receive the Holy Spirit without the fire. So there's lots of scriptures where you can go through where people receive the Holy Spirit, and there's only very few where they receive God's fire. One of the best examples is the day of Pentecost. It says that tongues of fire to be seen above their heads. And then it says that not only tongues of fire, but it says that they were clothed in dunamis power. So I've already told the story, but when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with fire, I felt burning hot flames inside my chest non-stop for 20 minutes. And I didn't bark like a dog. <laughs> Burning hot flames in my chest, and I still didn't bark like a dog. But I did lay down on the floor for quite a while. So what's my point? My point is, we all need the fire of the Holy Spirit, but I think it would be naive to teach that everybody already has that. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we grow up in a country like Bless, like Canada and Australia and so on, we kind of think that everything should be free and there shouldn't, we should be entitled to everything. You know, we get medical care because we're entitled to it, and we get money because we're entitled to it, and so we go, well, I'm a Christian, so I'm entitled to everything. I'm entitled to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm entitled to fire. So I just want to really point out that um, it can be quite uh, silly to presume that we already have everything that God has for us. Uh, the first thing that's going to do is it's, you've just chosen the way you want to level off in the kingdom. The minute you start with everything God has for me, you've just leveled off, and you can't give you much more. Because there's no more spiritual hunger. <clears throat> so we did, we did huge teachings on spiritual hunger. Um, I had my own revelation on it about 10 years ago. Somebody um, had, had a revelation and they shared it. They said that uh, God spoke to them about the anointing. And God said to them, I want to be so starving for the anointing that it would be like water in a desert. And if somebody was to offer you a suitcase with a million dollars cash, you would hit the suitcase and say, no, I want water. He said, when you're that hungry for the anointing, I'll give it to you. Yeah. And uh, I was in a meeting once and God spoke to me and said, if you can get the people to double their hunger, I will double the anointing. Amen. So I told the people and they said, yes, let's do it. Yeah. They doubled their hunger and guess what God did? Yeah. Doubled the anointing. Woo! Next guy I prayed for, blind eyes opened up. Wow. And it was, it was like heaven, it was literally like heaven just invaded earth. He was looking into my eyes and saying, I can see, I can see. Yeah. Face. He began describing what my face looks like. I said, what could you see before? Nothing, just black. So that's the kind of thing that God can do if we increase our hunger. We all know the story when Jesus went to his hometown. It says he could not do any mighty works. Now, what it doesn't say is that he chose not to do any mighty works. It says that he could not do any mighty works. Why would Jesus not be able to do any mighty works? One, one reason is because he did every miracle as a man, not as God. Yes, he was God. No one in this room is going to tell you Jesus was not God. But he chose to empty himself of his godly powers, and he took on humanity not 50%. He took on humanity 100%. He did every healing, every deliverance the same way that we would. 
fully relying on the Holy Spirit right. as an example of what we could do if we sanctified our life to Christ fully. Right. So, uh, that's pretty powerful, I don't know. Mm. So in Luke 10, 17, Jesus says, you think that's amazing, a little bit of deliverance. Let me tell you what I've seen. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions. Mm. Now, we've just been talking about the, the, the uh, disciples doing deliverance in the scripture before this. So the snakes and the scorpions are in direct reference to the, the, the demons coming out. Above. And then he talks about Satan coming down from heaven like lightning. So, uh, what am I getting at here? Firstly, there's a type of spirit that's literally a snake spirit. One of them is called python. Uh, the English word for python is divination. So, when people do tea leaves, that's divining. It's one of the ways people divine. Um, and when they do divination, the first spirit that will enter them is a spirit of python, which is literally a snake. And that's the one that can tell people their future, like the girl that was saying, these men are from God, they know the way to be saved, that's a divination spirit. So it's like false prophecy. So think of divination as a counterfeit prophecy, because it's telling of the future and what's going to happen, and sadly these, these people tell people that you're going to die from cancer at 62, guess what happens? Unless they get delivered and block it, that's what happens. Derek Prince had a lady with the spirit of divination come to him and say, I want deliverance, I want help. And so he's trying to pray for her and she says, she looks at him and the spirit of divination takes over and says, you're going to be wrecked in a car accident around a tree. So the demon just takes over and speaks this curse over Derek Prince and Derek Prince knows it's the spirit. He goes, no, I am not. And guess what? He never crashed into the tree. So just because that demon says it does not mean it's going to happen to you. Okay, because he lifted his shield of faith and he rejected the lie and said, No, I am not. So John 8 32 says, Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's page 20. Now, I just want to give you a quick revelation for free. If you know the lie, the lie will keep you into bondage. Bondage to what? Bondage to the mighty spirit that told you the lie. So the first revelation is the truth, if you know it, will set you free. The second revelation is the lie will hold you in bondage. So just put lies will hold you in bondage. One of the biggest legal rights that spirits have in Christians is when the, the Christian doesn't know the truth, doesn't believe the truth, and believes the lie. Now, we'll add this as well. The most common lies that Christians believe are negative things about themselves. Rejection. You can write that down. The most common lies are rejection. Nobody loves you. Your husband doesn't love you, kids don't love you, the church doesn't love you, everybody hates you, spirit of rejection. Next one, orphan spirit. People with an orphan spirit literally feel like they don't have any parents in the world and they're lost, totally lost. Put your hand up if you felt like that before. You feel like, you literally feel like an orphan. Some of the people with the orphan spirit actually were orphans. But you know what I tell them in the, in the ministry appointments? I tell them that uh, the Bible says you have been adopted by literally the spirit of adoption into God's family. And uh, we're doing this today, and I said, what I want you to say out loud is to be adopted into God's family is better than being adopted into the royal palace. Because God's royal palace is a little bit nicer than the Buckingham Palace, and it's going to last for just a little bit longer, like all of eternity. So which, which palace do you want to get adopted into? The one that's going to last 55 years, or the one that's going to last forever and ever with eternal value? So rejection, and then it's self-hatred and self-harm and self-loathing. They're all spirits, by the way. So... Um, the Bible calls Satan a tale bearer. A tale bearer is someone who comes up to you and tells you a tale, which is lies. How did Satan convince a third of the angels to fall? One, because they are offended that God made man above the angels. Two, because um, the second reason was because the tale bearer went around saying, I don't think God fully appreciates your gifts and your talents. You know, if I was in charge, I would give you a much higher place in heaven. So he was a tale bearer, the Bible says. He went around telling them tales. You know, in Job, when the, God says, where have you been? He goes to and fro on the earth, back and forth on it, looking around, seeing what's going on. Very interesting. Okay, John 8, 44. By the way, some of these scriptures you might hear and go, wow, that's a bit condemning, that's a bit harsh. 
you know, there's actually a spirit that twists scripture while you're hearing it and makes it more harsh. Mm -hmm. the, the, the chief culprit of that does that is called um, Leviathan. Mm -hmm. So you might want to write that down. Leviathan twists scripture. So um, it's the, one of the worst spirits a leader can have or a pastor can have is Leviathan. Because what it'll do is they'll hear the word of God and they'll literally teach almost the opposite of what it says. And they'll quote a million scriptures at you that are just so lies and so demonic because that spirit of Leviathan is in charge. And, uh, yeah, people are in different degrees of agreements with the spirits. So there could be a pastor that has that spirit that only listens to it 5% of the time. But you could have a leader that listens to it 90% of the time. And so there's varying degrees of how much legal right that people give the enemy in their life. So in John 8, 44, Jesus is talking to Pharisees and he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, but there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, but he's a liar and the father of lies. So when, you, when you've got a list of 30 of lies that you've been believing, who do you think might have told you those lies? Satan? Is it possible that it came through an evil spirit and not the devil himself? Yes. Is it possible that it came through a human being mm -hmm. yeah. that had a demon spirit? Oh, yeah. Is it possible that it came through your mum and dad growing up? Yeah. Teacher? Yeah. Pastor? Yeah. Scary, isn't it? You've got demons talking to you through people telling you you'll never amount to anything. You're going to fail at this and you're going to fail at that. There's word curses people speak. Sickness. Just wild, wild stuff. So uh, we never speak over somebody, don't do this or this bad thing will happen to you. This bad thing will happen to you. So, you know, if you've done that, it's a good idea to just repent of that because you don't want to speak fear over people. I mean, you can carefully educate people, but you've got to be careful not to speak death over people, speak sickness over people. So uh, we just renounce those word curses. So in a deep deliverance, we would get people to renounce word curses, like, I renounce the lie that I'm going to be sick and die at a young age. That is a lie that a lot of demons sow into people's heads. That they're not going to live to a old age, they're going to die. Even people that have no health problems. Spirit of suicide causes suicidal thoughts. There will be at least five to ten people in this room that have a spirit of suicide. Telling them to kill themselves. So uh, if you have that, don't leave tonight without tapping me on the shoulder and saying, hey, pray for me. And uh, all I'll get you to do is say, I renounce the lie that I want to kill myself. I choose Jesus Christ who came to bring me life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, we're going to skip forward. So you want to skip forward or you want to have a break? Um, it's 8.15, so whatever you All right, so uh, what we were planning to do is have a little break um, so people <laughs> can sort of move and shake around, get the blood flow. If you um, aren't so keen on a break and you want to get some work done, I'll tell you one thing you could do. If you skip to the back of the manual, it gives you a list of lies to write down that you believe. You probably should have made this a five-day conference, but anyway. <laughs> All right, so this... Okay, so it's on... should be on page uh, 29, if you've got the, the new one. If the old one has the lies on it too, somewhere. So you're basically you're looking for the word lies and truth. And uh, usually when it comes to like strong Christians and strong believers, usually this is the only legal right the enemy normally has in, in their life. So that's why it's a really important step. So while we're having our break, if you want to get some work done, write down every lie that's been sown into your heart from a young age till now. So think of the lies. You'll never amount to anything. The lie might be, I'm always going to be sick. I'm never going to be healed. I'm not going to be delivered. A lot of, lot of them say, you're never going to be delivered. I'm staying here forever. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to curse you. I'm going to curse him. I'm going to curse you. If you have a spirit saying, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to curse you. Listen, I've heard it a thousand times. It's not going to happen. We've had big spirits say it a thousand times. I'm going to curse you. I'm going to kill you. Just ignore it. Lift up your shield of faith and go, no, you're not. You're just lying, lying, lying. Amen. So put down the lies there, um, and then yeah. what we're going to do is we're going to replace the lie with the truth. The truth is usually just exactly the opposite of the lie, which is that I'm not ugly, I'm not stupid, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. I am valuable. I am valuable. Most people think they're worth about 30 pieces of silver, which is what they paid for Jesus. Do you want to know what you're worth? 
But you can tell what something's worth by how much somebody's prepared to pay for it. If someone's prepared to pay a million dollars for your house, guess what? That means your house is worth exactly a million dollars. If someone's prepared to pay 700000 then your house is worth 700000 Your house is worth exactly what the market is willing to pay at that time. What price was Jesus willing to pay for you? Every hamper So how much is it value? Priceless. Priceless. That's your value. So let's, uh, let's write that down, that you're the most expensive thing Jesus ever paid for. People need to hear that. They need to know that. And uh, we're going to have a bit of a break if people want coffee or, or water and chit-chat. If you make a friend, grab their number so you can stay in touch. A lot of people here that are in fight for Jesus. It's a good crowd to connect with. Take someone's number, don't be shy. And uh, we can have some questions and answers after this, just a little 10-minute break. And uh, not only question and answers, but for those who stay, we're going to actually take you through the steps of deliverance. So I'm going to lead us all in a repentance prayer, which is repenting of everything that we've probably done, including attitudes like pride and rebellion and jealousy and all that. And then I'm going to lead us in a generational repentance, cleansing the bloodline. So these are the things our ancestors did. And if I see something yucky, like repent of human sacrifices, they go, my family didn't do human sacrifices. I'll say, oh yeah, where's your family from? Oh, they're from Europe. Okay, let's go back 300 years. <laughs> we have to go back 300 years. And Druids were doing that all over the place. The Vikings. My ancestors were Vikings, right? They used to take their little newborn baby, leave it out in the freezing cold all night, right? And if it was alive the next day, it was probably a strong warrior. If it died, it was an offering to the gods. Okay? Now, would you think those things were gods? <laughs> no, they were devils. So I went to the deliverance on a young lady in BC. And uh, this story is awesome. And she says, she says, I saw them leaving a baby out in the cold. I said, did you know that Vikings actually did that? And she says, no, I had no idea. This girl has never read anything about this in her life and saw it in a vision. So the Holy Spirit leads you through deliverance, shows you visions. And sometimes evil spirits even show you their legal right and how they came in. So it could come from the Holy Spirit, it could come from the evil spirit. When you see things like that, the visions, like graphic things, it's usually, it might not happen to you, but it might happen to someone you're praying for. It's usually about how the spirit got in in the first place. So if it's a Freemason ritual, if it's a witchcraft ritual, quickly get them to repent their ancestors doing whatever the graphic thing is that they saw. Because people go into these graphic visions of what their ancestors did. The reason is not to scare them, it's to get them to repent and apply the blood of Jesus to that open door and then cast the spirit that entered out. So uh, that's pretty powerful. After she got delivered, the Spirit said that the curse on the land, because of her ancestors' sins, had now lifted off Norway, Norway Denmark, that whole region. Wow. So the land was actually cursed because of things her ancestors did. After she got delivered from all these spirits, the curse, the, apparently the curses were lifted off the land that her ancestors had put on the land. So deliverance can be really powerful. Um, so let's uh, break up and uh, if you have time, write down some lies there and we're going to replace it with the truth and then we're going to rebuke any spirits that are still hiding. And there shouldn't be any demons left in Duncan in about 45 minutes. Hallelujah. <laughs> 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 awesome. Oh, yeah. We've got that. <laughs> 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 <